All right, that was pretty uneventful. All right, Thomas, you're um, you're called David in this uh, session. Not quite sure why that's the case. Why? Yeah, you have my. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, David, you're in double. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll just uh, make a no make a note to the uh, organizers to see if there's something on. I, me, I see you, uh, so I don't know why. You see, you see me as Claire. Yeah. No, there is perhaps a reason because uh, I copy past the link to the session uh, that was. Uh, perhaps I have a different uh, link for me. Ah, you've come in as a different moderator. Let's come back on that if I find it. How long do I have to find it? Um, you, 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 you've got as long as it as long as it takes. If you um, it should be in your email, I think. Yeah, you are live right. at the moment. Um, but it looks like um, because there are um, five other tracks going on at the moment, a lot of people will probably be finishing up the other tracks before they join this one. So. I receive apparently a uh, no. The problem is that I receive a lot of link on hopping. I can certainly explain to the uh, the audience if we'd like to get get going, but we've actually. I think I think some people will probably still be leaving the other session. It's still three funny. Uh, I will try to click uh, on another uh, link uh, just right now to see okay. whether. It's... Do you want to leave that one? Do you want me to? I can kick you off even. <laughs> it's a bit bold. <laughs> Apparently, it's not using my. That's okay. We can explain to the um, the audience. Uh, David, underneath the uh, ceiling fan, is David from Google. <laughs> David in front of the window is actually Thomas from L'Oreal. <laughs> Claire, maybe there's a way of pinging. Uh... Uh, okay. I think I just found the right one. Okay. Yeah, I will uh, go out of this one and try uh, to connect with the other one, okay? Perfect. So how are things otherwise, David? Excellent. Terrific. Yeah. It's a nice day with you. Uh, Early in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I have my sheets closed because of the lighting, but normally I get a lot of sun through the window, so not perfect for a video, you know, but. Oh, no, uh, good, good, good lighting, I think. Mine's a little bit uh, too bright, actually. I hear that. There we go. So uh, we have a lot of people. Okay, no. no, David, David. <laughs> okay, we'll just explain to people in the con online chat. Funny because here I really use uh, the link that was at my name. But... Hmm. So, um, my name is Claire Barrett at uh, APIs First Consulting, and we're delighted to uh, have the opportunity um, for this roundtable session sponsored. Uh, by IBM as a gold sponsor and um, uh, sorry, it's Google. I really am tired. Apologies. <laughs> so, um, uh, and to be honest, these events would not be available. You just couldn't run them for the community without um, sponsorship from uh, uh, from all of the uh, organisations such as Google. And it's fantastic to introduce 
Thomas Spiegel, um, with a name up here is David Foyer, uh, <laughs> the Chief Architect at L'Oreal, and uh, very exciting to have you here. And uh, uh, also to be joined by David from Google, uh, who's Senior Product Manager, joining us from the US. So um, thank you both uh, very much for being here today. And uh, I'd love you, um, David, um, Thomas, to just give us a, a quick overview about L'Oreal and some of the exciting transformation work that you're leading. Um, yeah, definitely, Claire, thank you. So L'Oreal, I imagine that uh, all of you, you, you do have a product of L'Oreal in your bathroom or you do consume, you are part of the two billion uh, consumer we, we have a uh, bit in the world. But uh, L'Oreal be behind all of this uh, fantastic uh, product you can uh, all uh, see uh, is now uh, going through a, a strong transformation with a motto, which is uh, being the be first beauty tech in the world. So that the alliance of beauty and the alliance of, of tech together. So it creates uh, something uh, very new in, in our industry, which is what it's a data-driven company first, and uh, I think that some others are doing that. But above a data-driven company, it's an augmented uh, company in terms of product augmentation, in terms of employee augmentation, in terms of consumer augmentation. And you will see that um, APIs are a big game changer in, in such a transformation. So apart from that, what is L'Oreal? L'Oreal, it's a 30 billion turnover. It's 7 billion uh, product uh, produced and, uh, and sold every year, 7 billion uh, products. So uh, one, one per inhabitants of, uh, of our earth, earth sorry. And, uh, and at the end of the day, is, it is, uh, as I was saying, 2 billion consumer with a higher and higher degree of uh, personalization um, every day. And once again, on that too, APIs is a game changer. But I think we'll come back on that. That's terrific. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, it, it's actually uh, astounding how uh, such a powerhouse like L'Oreal is leveraging APIs uh, for strategic advantage in the market and doing such interesting things. Uh, I'm sorry, Claire, I cut you off. Did you, uh, did you want uh -huh. to follow up? Perfect. So uh, let's get started because I'm super eager to find out some things uh, I know I've been on the journey uh, together, you know, Google and L'Oreal have been on the journey together, uh, but for our audience's sake, I wanted to explore a little bit about API product strategy with you. And specifically, you know, we've all seen how APIs drive customer experiences in retail. We've seen an increase in online engagement, both as a result of COVID-19 and as a result of digital transformation going on in the industry in general. And I guess the question I have for you is, how has this affected your technology stack? Like what's the balance between stability and agility and what are you doing to better adapt to this new, more digital world? And how do APIs play a role in that? You know, it's true. And you mentioned COVID-19. COVID-19 is a fabulous accelerator in all of this journey. Who would have imagined uh, the place of uh, social selling uh, one, uh, one year ago? the fact that uh, we will uh, sometime uh, shift uh, from one uh, channel to another like that in a couple of weeks on uh, some of our most important market. Uh, who would have imagined uh, what is happening today in Asia or in China uh, with a fantastic uh, consumer uh, experience shift uh, directly uh, interacting with our beauty advisor? Nobody. So uh, once again, uh, the closer we are coming to the consumer, the more we are going to personalization, meaning a product for a given customer, the more APIs we need in order to make sure that we, we can tailor made this, this type of services. So API is simply in a large company like L'Oreal, the ingredients that makes this agility possible because at the end L'Oreal is not so different from other companies. Yes, we have our legacies. Uh, yes, we have our backboard system. Yes, we have systems that are much more difficult to move and or to, to redeploy to route. But APIs are these uh, ingredients, this uh, salt and, uh, and paper that makes it uh, much more easy and tasty in a quicker manner. So that's a game changer. That's a terrific analogy. You know, I, I love that because uh, most people think of, you know, the downside of, let's say, forced digital transformation with state homeowners 
uh, stay-at-home orders and all those sorts of things. But the fact that you're calling it a fabulous accelerator is, uh, is invigorating, right? How would you recommend other companies that are, let's say, on the same journey and, and you know, are nervous about the risk associated with uh, forcing yourself into that type of more agile, more API-driven experiences, go-to-market strategy. How would you recommend other companies look at it and, and, and other folks that are on this journey, how can they work together with their peers and other stakeholders to develop a model that works for them in their industry? Uh, I would take the, the end of your question, a model that, that works for them. Meaning, uh, I consider it's a, a thing where nothing is written. So it has to, on one side, obviously work with the DNA of your product strategy and your go-to strategy. And that's sometimes pretty unique uh, from one company to, to another but also uh, the way the various uh, consumers can and want to interact at, at market level. And we do see today that uh, in the way people are consuming services, new experiences and so on, there is a large differentiation from one geography to another. So I think, uh, and uh, we, I speak a lot about product in terms of uh, physical, genuine, uh, uh, L'Oreal product, but uh, API as a product is also a way, in fact, if uh, you just put together what is at stake in terms of uh, go-to strategy and what is at stake in terms of packaging the services together with the API to be pretty powerful in the way to address or to create new needs even to shape the market with this new type of needs. I, I will give you a, an example uh, for L'Oreal. We can come back on it. Uh, for instance, more and more, because of COVID, uh, we can no longer go to shops and do some real try-on of the products. It's impossible, and it will even be less and less safe uh, with uh, the COVID condition. But obviously, you still want to try on before buying a, a product. So virtual try on and augmented reality is a very powerful uh, uh, proposal that we have. It's called Modiface uh, with, uh, with L'Oreal. And obviously, it, it can be diffused and consumed both on any uh, and, uh, the device, on any marketplace, including the, the largest one you can imagine. Uh, but also uh, in various channels of, uh, of distribution where simply consuming these APIs do make you as a consumer, uh, do give you as a consumer this possibility of this virtual try -on. Just imagine, it's almost limitless in terms of capacity. Another example that I could take is the capacity to make highly personalized uh, product for you. So what does it mean? By simply being able through various algorithms, through the simple camera of your uh, device to see the type of skin or uh, the type of uh, uh, of exposure you have uh, towards uh, UV or whatever, and make sure that the product recommendations that will come from that through the consumption of an API will be the exact right one for you. So it's endless. So that's fascinating. I really want to explore that for a second, and then I promise we'll get to some audience questions. You just launched a virtual uh, makeup app, right? Uh, L'Oreal, I'm sorry, launched a virtual makeup app, and I'm sure obviously you contributed to that. Uh, and, and you were talking about how that, uh, that fundamentally your API platform and your API strategy is enabling you to make differences in others' geographies and really uh, take advantage of, let's say, uh, specific market needs in specific other geographies. On the other side, though, you're talking about how those APIs are helping you drive personalization and really understanding the consumer on an individual level versus, let's say, the market at a macro level. How do you do that? I mean, from an API perspective, I think we all sort of think about, you know, generic ways of, of accessing functionality and applications. How do you take that geography-specific uh, information and, and expertise that L'Oreal has and compartmentalize that so that you drive an API strategy that's in sync with the market strategy and the consumer needs for that market. <laughs> ah, you're almost at our IEP level here. No, but uh, how, how, <laughs> no, the, how do we do that? It's, it's obviously, obviously the strong link uh, uh, between the APIs and, uh, and the powerful uh, capacity, uh, data capacity that uh, we are putting behind. 
And, and what is very interesting in a company like L'Oreal, which is very rich of data, as you can imagine, for uh, over 100 uh, years, we are working on a daily basis on how to improve our product, and we are really, really rich on data. But the API is simply creating this gateway on one side to access the more localized data, uh, which uh, can be uh, obviously feeding uh, the right algorithm to be consumed through services via APIs. And on the other side, to explore, to, to make sure that we are uh, taking the best out of this very massive data set that, as I have said, uh, we have been uh, creating uh, for uh, over one century. That's awesome. This idea of uh, API personalization, that really you're taking uh, all of the expertise that's been built up over 100 years uh, and delivering that through APIs through a next generation distribution mechanism uh, to consumers. Uh, whereas, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, uh, all of that uh, information expertise was really compartmentalized in a direct person to person experience in a retail location. So that's, that's fascinating. And, and I may say that there is another side of it. Um, you know, Today, consumer wants more and more to, to understand what they are buying, which is highly normal. They want to understand what's inside the product. They want to understand what the impact of this product on the environment or things like that. And on one side, it's because of law, but on the other side, it's because of the normal uh, and normal way for our consumer to go. And once again, API is the right way to make sure that our consumer can access to the level of data they want in order to make sure that they are buying the best for themselves, for the planet, and so on and so on. Yeah, makes total sense. Uh, if you don't mind, let's go over one of the audience questions because I feel like I've been mono uh, you know, monopolizing the time here. Uh, one of the audience questions that we got uh, was, have you noticed a KPI that shows APIs accelerate your time to delivery innovation? What are the sorts of KPIs you're using internally? How do you view delivery innovation in terms of SDLC and sort of speed to market? Uh, and what are the sorts of things you look at to make sure that you're on the right track, or let's say you're not on the right track and you have to course correct? To be fully honest, I, I consider that uh, we are still on the journey on that because the promise is there, and we have some uh, very good uh, case where indeed uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic accelerator in this uh, overall time to market. On the other side, and especially around the, the legacy aspect of it, uh, there is still um, some internal change management to, to make, to make it sure, because it's disruptive, as we have uh, been saying. And uh, for people uh, that were used uh, to, to uh, make sure that uh, the silo of data and accessibility were as poor as possible, uh, today there are still some mindset change to make it as powerful as it can be on the technical side. So I will say that we have several KPIs following, but for a company at the size of L'Oreal, it's a journey. I used to say that it's a two to three years journey, and uh, we have started it. We are not yet finished. Perfect. That, that's a terrific answer. Uh, Claire, I think you want to lead with some of the, audience, the live audience questions. Yeah, we've had um, a couple of questions from uh, Jerome and, and Quentin. So Jerome's asked about, can you, um, uh, uh, Thomas, please um, sort of summarize some of the key stages in this this two to three plus year uh, journey that yeah. you've been on. No, I think the, there is a first stage, which was uh, to see the potential value and uh, what I would call the enablement of APIs. I was speaking about uh, augmenting the product, augmenting the consumer, augmenting the employee. So meaning it was a promise to make that happening, so to add some data, some services with our product, some uh, more services directly connected to our end consumer, which was not a given because obviously at the very early stage, we were quite often uh, locked at uh, distribution level. It's a way for us to access to our uh, end consumer, which is highly important as you can easily imagine. So that's the first thing, the strategy of that. The second thing, uh, was also, and in a company like us, it's a, it's a challenge uh, to make sure that uh, making API as a product, we had to find product owners. Uh, and it could look obvious, but I can tell you that it was not necessarily so obvious. The easiest way was to link, obviously, uh, the data owner with the product owner. It's done on a large set of areas of uh, data families and API family. 
it's, uh, it was uh, not necessarily a, a given, so second stage. Third stage, because the API, API journey in a, an organization at the size of L'Oreal did start in several areas, was to come back to catalog them to make sure that we knew all the good that was already existing because it did not happen from one day to another and to make sure that uh, we put back some standard and reusability of it uh, with obviously a concept of cataloging uh, supporting the overall governance after that choice of technology because in company at the size of L'Oreal it was key to to find a global uh, technology and obviously here the choice of a PG uh, was done at this time in order to make sure that uh, there was a clear technology uh, choice uh, at L'Oreal so and now now it's a strategy I would say by domain it's a so, so strategy um, uh, to enable some very large transfer internal transformation program that are happening at L'Oreal to make a very basic uh, motto which is API first if not API only a reality and it's uh, it's clearly uh, the motto guiding our daily choices and then last but not least which is not a step that we have reached today uh, the monetization external monetization of uh, of API externally we are not yet there honestly I would say we are ready if needed, but we have not uh, um, done this step yet today at L'Oreal. Thank you. I think that's a fantastic summary of, um, to explain to people the, the journey that you've been on. Um, I have had a question about maybe what some of the learnings uh, or roadblocks you, you mentioned, um, uh, finding even for a company that's, uh, you know, with L'Oreal's history that is, you know, would know more about product and marketing and branding some, to find challenges with API product managers uh, is an interesting learning. Are there, there are other things that, uh, you know, if you were just, uh, that, that you would be telling yourself a couple of years ago, <laughs> uh, if you knew, uh, knew then what you know now that might, uh, <laughs> might be. Yeah, the, the challenges, you know, at the end uh, of the day, uh, API are becoming more and more part of, uh, the digital asset of, of L'Oreal, obviously. It's easy to say that, but uh, in a company like us, where obviously the brand asset is so important, huh? it, uh, and the product asset as well, obviously, uh, it's, uh, it was very important to strategize a way that this API will complement, and really the, the word complement is important, uh, the overall brand asset of L'Oreal. We have progressed, I think, we are still a area of uh, avenue of improvement and we will continue to make that happening. Why? Because in a beauty tech driven uh, and data driven company, obviously the API is simply uh, the gateway uh, to make sure that this is a reality, especially for an extended company logic where more and more we are shaping also our overall ecosystem. And once again, API is at the center of this strategy. The difficult things, and uh, I think we should not underestimate that uh, whatever the technology is highly powerful and do enable uh, us to do that. But obviously, the mindset change, the reshape of the practices with our overall ecosystem and so on, simply take uh, some time more times. There are some other industry, and I imagine that uh, during these API days, uh, where it was simply a condition to for survival. It was not at the early stage in our uh, industry. So for us, it's an additional uh, way to make it. It's also a way to swap, as uh, we were explaining at the early stage, uh, very easily from uh, one uh, channel to another. Uh, but it was not a condition for survival, which make it a bit more long uh, compared to some other, I don't know, banking or, or whatever industry. Yeah, no, thank you. David, I know you had uh, a number of, of, of questions that you were keep... I'll throw to you next. Yeah, Please. perfect, thanks. Uh, so there was a time when APIs were conditioned for survival. Uh, that's fascinating. And of course, uh, we know that sort of as the market has moved forward, APIs have become uh, much more synonymous with digital products and being, uh, being customer sensitive and external market sensitive. But there's also this, internal agility story, right? The ability to get access to all of your internal assets and repackage these business capabilities very quickly to ship new products to market. So on, on the one hand, there's this external APIs 
developers, partners, ecosystem story. And on the other hand, there's this internal digital nervous system uh, reconfiguring and reshipping new branded products story. And so the question is, which is more important? Like, where are you seeing and seeding the most innovation? Is it internally? Is it with developers? Uh, uh, where is your focus? Uh, but to be very honest, long term, I have a strong belief that uh, externally is more important. Short term and today, what is very obvious is that uh, this internal agility is key. Why? Uh, and here it's perhaps more the, the architect who is, uh, who is speaking because it's for us the, the most powerful way we have for the decoupling strategy. And we are definitely in that. It's the most powerful way we have uh, to avoid the lock in of uh, whatever legacy or vendor that we are having. It's also the most powerful solution we have to enable uh, to enable this agility that you described that are more and more important. Let's take a case, for instance, order management system. Today, order management system is something where from one uh, brand or a division to another, from one market to another, is different. We must be able to plug and plug, change our system like a Lego brick. And honestly, the only way to make that is to surround all of this business capability with API. So that's why, obviously, short term, I'm very keen to, to work and to enable that as, mo as much as possible. Perfect. So let me double click on that. When you talk about order management systems, you're really talking about the underlying infrastructure that supports your, your retail IT stack, right? And so by unlocking, by using APIs to unlock all that functionality, you can suddenly both get supplier independence because you can start to swap out order management systems, and you can create applications that are uh, that speak to an API facade, so they don't have to know anything about the underlying order management systems. Suddenly, they can apply in different geographies that have different OMS systems. Would you say that that's a type of internal ecosystem? I mean, would you say that let's say your internal, chain... external, it's a both. <laughs> Sorry, I, I missed that. What did you say? No, no, it's internal, external, and there is a blurry line uh, in the middle uh, because it's internal with all, with all our legacy ERPs and so on, as uh, any company you can imagine. It's internal because obviously part of the logistic in a company like L'Oreal is very internal uh, with our whatever distribution center management system and so on. And it's obviously external because uh, obviously uh, this is a link to our uh, distributors and, and whatever. So it's it's a blurry line. And that's the beauty of, uh, of API. At the end of the day, I don't care whether it's internal or external. Yeah, it, that, that's really, really cool. So if I am a, an employee of L'Oreal and I'm developing an application that has to access the order management system, I use the API just like an external client would. Mm. Awesome. Yes. Uh, that's terrific. Uh, do we have, oh, it looks like, uh, Claire, we have another audience question. Let's go to that. We do. Yannick's just asked about um, how, and this is a challenge uh, you know, for so many businesses in terms of how do you combine an an old middleware uh, based thinking um, and, and probably the skill sets and, and governance and policies and processes and everything else that go along with that, all those architectural um, stronghold positions um, with an API uh, led transformation, which. You know, uh, it's a, it's a fantastic question that I like. <laughs> now it's my daily challenge, okay. if I may say so. No, but uh, what, what is clear is that there is still a place that has to be uh, smaller and smaller every day. Uh, for various uh, layers of integration as we knew it uh, from the past, for various reasons, because uh, first, uh, some legacy system can almost only easily be integrated uh, this way. Uh, on the other side, there are also several ecosystems of distribution, and once again, it depends from one geography to another, that are, that are still very linked to old-fashioned way and to make it simple, to the revolution in some uh, uh, channel of distribution has not yet happened, so forcing us to still go to old way of integrating. The last thing is obviously a company at the size of L'Oreal, you can imagine that we have a, a few uh, thousands of legacy solutions and applications, and sometimes, honestly, uh, there is uh, no reason uh, to put money on things that uh, we must unset uh, as early as possible. So that are all the things. So th this combination of, uh, of layer of uh, hybrid approach is important. But 
what is very important also is that uh, the change of mindset and you know uh, I used to have a fantastic slide with a balance saying uh, and uh, monitoring uh, year by year uh, the type of technologies that uh, we are using uh, and so on and what is very important in this motto I was uh, explaining to you which is API first if not API only is to put very strongly the push uh, on that it's not uh, easy on at the start uh, and it's also not easy on because it has to go uh, together with a uh, full reskilling uh, activities uh, uh, of uh, internal uh, people and uh, to be very clear there is also a, a, a stress to be put on our external partner which are not always likely uh, to go too much to API because at the end of the day, the economic equation for some partner is not necessarily as good as uh, with some uh, other uh, legacy integration technologies. That's fantastic. And um, we've got another question from Guillaume actually about um, uh, what could be an asset for pushing um, standard APIs by industry or leaders in the market? Um, Clearly, something the technology industry has been. Uh, ah, but it's a it's a fantastic question. That's what I was calling uh, shaping the the uh, shaping the, the market. Uh, obviously, uh, as a leader like L'Oréal, uh, we can have interest to make sure that uh, the market orientation towards a kind of API uh, it shapes the, the way we want. I, I will give you also a, an example. Uh, the cosmetic industry uh, must be uh, clear and transparent. I was taking the case of uh, environmental data yeah. and ingredients uh, towards the consumer. Our interest is to have a global industry standard to make sure that uh, as an industry, uh, we give the confidence that uh, the consumer do require and obviously standardizing this way of accessing environmental of, or any other type of data touching our consumer is key. So that's the way we are going. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I think I've got a slot for a question. Right, Claire? There's no more on here. I, I know that Thomas has a hard stop in nine minutes. So there absolutely is time, David, for, um, uh, for another killer question. Terrific. Okay. So uh, let's get provocative and controversial. Uh, no, I'm joking. Um, if I look at L'Oreal's sustainability commitments before 2030, I can totally see how digital is helping achieve those goals. For instance, instead of consumers actually going into location and actually wasting, let's say, makeup to try it on, they can suddenly do that digitally, which uh, has a lot better impact on the environment and a lot better impact both for consumer costs as well as L'Oreal's costs. So everybody's benefit, everybody benefits. And I'm sure this also affects uh, skill set retention because uh, there's a certain class of, let's say, up and coming software developers, engineers, product managers that really want to work for companies that have those types of sustainability commitments and take sustainability very seriously. Have you thought at all from a digital perspective at looking at the, the sustainability aspects of your supply chain and possibly opening that up. Have you looked at API supply chains at all and how sustainability might play into that and how you might be able to uh, not just optimize your own internal use of it, but possibly sell that as an asset to third parties who are also looking at maybe less bold commitments, but still are committed to sustainability and want to sort of get access to that, uh, that type of distribution, manufacturing, et cetera. No, th thank you for this answer. And um, it's funny because we did not prepare the <laughs> together. And uh, not later than two, year, two days ago, we are having a, a very targeted workshop exactly with this question. So I should have invited you. Uh -huh. uh, uh, sort of, yes. Are we there yet? N not yet, uh, to be totally transparent and honest. But uh, honestly, I do consider, and it's uh, also linked to my very personal belief, um, that it's indeed uh, first a differentiator, but also simply a must uh, as a company with uh, such uh, engagement. And uh, 
I see uh, an avenue and the, of uh, what I would call a, an overall life cycle that could be uh, uh, consumed via APIs, uh, explaining obviously what is uh, uh, the, the gain in terms of uh, potential impact, whatever type of uh, potential environmental or impact, but also a way to be very transparent uh, via the consumption of services linked to an API of what is the impact we are creating. And uh, I do also have, and it's another way of looking at it, a, a strong belief that uh, by making the people very conscious on what type of impact you are creating, you are creating uh, a way for them to simply consume in a, in a better manner. Because obviously, if I take back uh, your example, uh, I prefer by by far to have a virtual try-on than a, uh, a real one uh, in the shop. But even the virtual try-on, if you run it every two seconds, will have an impact. Sure. And even that, we want to make the people conscious, and it's part of uh, of uh, of the commitment we must go. So it's definitely something. Uh, and I was with a, a large team uh, two days ago, uh, where we we want to progress in, in the coming months, less than one year. That's terrific. And, and, and just to follow up on that, right, you, you talked a little bit about transparency of impact and how uh, leveraging applications uh, to really drive transparency to consumers. Are you doing the sorts of things uh, that, with, let's say, diversity and inclusion, right, where some folks may not be necessarily uh, comfortable going to a retail location and talk to a person, but they certainly want to participate in, uh, in purchasing L'Oreal's products and trying them and so applications like mo using monofaces technology, et cetera, can help drive diversity and inclusion in the whole process of uh, try before you buy. De definitely, it's allowed, It's an inclusion because you no longer have uh, the problem of going to the place or daring to go or daring to be in front of somebody asking uh, the question. So yes, it's a, it's a great part of this. I, Fully agree with you. Awesome. It's one of those areas where I see technology really helping and really driving uh, new yeah. positive experiences. You know, people think about, oh, it's a colder experience. I don't get the same face to face experience, but there's benefits to that as well. And so uh, I look forward to having an opportunity when we can really have both and, and everybody can do what works for them. Uh, that would be awesome. Uh, okay. It sounds like we have time for, uh, for one more quick question. And then, uh, and then uh, Thomas, if possible, I'd like you just to give some wrapping some uh, some final thoughts before we wrap up. Uh, so I wanted to take one of the last audience questions that we got. Um, uh, so yep. you talked a little bit about linking, uh, you talked a little bit about how you aligned API products with data, right? And uh, how do you link the data owner with the product owner? You know, as we move from this uh, idea that you're a custodian of infrastructure, you're a middleware person, you're a database person, you're this, to this full stack world, how do you sort of say this person owns this data in this database and they also own these microservices and the associated APIs? How do you segment that and figure out the ownership model to, to basically figure out who builds which APIs for which consumers and which markets? Uh, and uh, though first, it's a long journey. Uh, I will not say we are perfect, but the way we figure out is pretty straightforward. You know, uh, L'Oreal has some other companies are pretty... Uh, decentralized uh, company in many aspects and uh, as i was saying the question of um, ownership uh, of uh, data and products uh, has been and is a challenge even if we did progress a lot so we came with a very basic things we had the chance of the, the creation of a new business organization which is owning uh, the, the various class of uh, data and uh, in fact, uh, just took the, the chance of, of this uh, organization to be set up at the very high level of the company with the right level uh, of sponsorship. Uh, and uh, linking simply the class of data, the domain of data uh, with a related API and making this link also towards uh, the, the, the API catalog. Uh, making sure that at least this very basic and easy governance could be applied. So you have a data, you are, uh, for instance, uh, responsible for its quality, 
for the way we secure it, obviously. And by the way, one of the way to, to make it sure that it's well consumed in a secure manner and so on, we did not touch too much this point, but uh, the question of security for accessing the data is key in the API world. Um, this through the API, so let's govern the API uh, as a product within this type of uh, package. It's as easy as that. It's uh, very straightforward, but that's the simplest way we have found till now to, to make that happen. No, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I'm glad you left some things on the table for us to discuss for our next, uh, the next section we decide <laughs> to have. So now I've got, a, I've got a hook to pull you back in. Uh, thank you very much. That was awesome. Uh, do you have any parting thoughts to the crowd about the API journey that you're on and L'Oreal's journey and how people can take that uh, back to the companies that they work in and how they can how they can use the information that you shared with us today and your experience for their own benefit. Yeah, but very clear, it's a fantastic journey. It's about passion. When you understand what is at stake, it's, it's as I, I use several uh, strong words like fabulous and so on, because it is. And uh, perhaps use the motto, API first, if not API only. And it's easy. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, thanks again, Thomas. It's been a privilege being, uh, being on this journey together with you uh, and L'Oreal. And I look forward to our next talk. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Claire. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been fantastic. I really loved your, your, uh, all your insights. Bye -bye. It's very conscious that you um, you have something to go. We do have another couple of minutes. I don't know whether um, uh, anybody in the audience has some specific Google questions for David that now is the time. Um, uh, um, but particularly on behalf of the uh, API community more broadly, um, we really do thank uh, Google for um, uh, sponsoring this event and for um, providing uh, fantastic um, uh, speaking opportunities. Thomas's uh, insights are just amazing. I love the clarity of uh, purpose, um, the way that he's able to, the, the honesty with which he described the um, API proposition for them, you can you can sense a real uh, uh, a real passion and and, uh, um, and a love of the subject and, and a vision for for what it can deliver in perhaps an industry that we don't know so much, we don't see so many examples of. Absolutely. Um, so um, so thank you very much. Um, thank you all. The great audience too. Um, lots of good questions. So uh, yeah, thanks all for participating. Terrific being here, and Claire, look forward to, to our next uh, the next session. Yeah, sorry for the um, bit of the glitchy start at the beginning. It was a little bit bumpy um, <laughs> going straight from another session. So uh, um, really fantastic, and have a lovely day, um, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference for all of you uh, in the audience. Thanks so, all. Thank you, Dave. Bye.